Thank you very much, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker. Um, the first point I'd like to raise is regarding the ministerial code and the actions of the Prime Minister. Um, it is quite clear under the ministerial code, and I'm glad to see the Attorney General is sitting here uh, on the front bench, uh, that the law officers must be consulted in good time before the government is committed to critical decisions involving legal considerations. Now, even if I was prepared to concede, which I'm not, that it follows that the law officers don't necessarily have to divulge their opinions, though actually uh, he's been obliged to do so by a resolution of the House on the 4th of December in the past. The question is, as a matter of fact, which the Prime Minister today and two days ago has resolutely refused to answer me, did the Prime Minister consult the law officers as a matter of fact? I asked her and she refused twice time. The inference is that she did not. Is this not misleading the House? That is a question which worries me intensely. Mr Speaker, having dealt with that issue, which I regard as very serious, I also have to say that I take the strongest possible objection, as do many other distinguished lawyers, QCs and former judges, to the action that has been taken by the Government in purporting to enter into a binding agreement in international law which purportedly alters the UK's exit date from the European Union in advance of the votes by each House on the draft regulations which would effect, which would create an alteration to exit day in the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. It has been suggested, Mr Speaker, that the Act requires that the draft regulations can only be submitted to each House for an affirmative resolution once the date of exit has been altered at international <coughs> level. This is simply not correct. The provision for approval by affirmative resolution is a freestanding provision in Schedule 7, paragraph 14, under which a draft instrument is to be submitted to the House. It was incumbent on the Government, Mr Speaker, to respect the normal practice of allowing Parliament to approve any legislative changes before entering into a binding international obligation. Mr Speaker, I was the Attorney, Shadow Attorney General during the uh, Iraq debacle, and I have to say, Mr Speaker, that on that occasion it became apparent that there should have been consultation with Parliament on a matter of the gravest national importance. And the reality is, I, if I may say, obliged or created the circumstances in which the then Attorney General submitted his opinion to the House. Uh, we had a similar situation with regard to the issue of the bombing of Syria uh, more recently. So the idea that Parliament is not required to approve any legislative changes before entering into a bi binding international obligation is well established recently in precedent. The course taken seeks to prevent, present Parliament with a fait accompli in which Parliament is, is pressured to approve the draft regulations because failure to do so would cause disconformity it is alleged by the Minister just now, between the UK's international obligations and domestic law. Under our constitutional law, Mr Speaker, the power of the United Kingdom Government to conclude binding agreements with states and other international actors, such as the European Union, exists under the royal prerogative. It is a basic principle of our constitutional law that the royal prerogative may only be exercised consistently with the intention of Parliament. Any purported exercise of that power of the royal prerogative that is inconsistent with the intention of Parliament is unlawful and of no effect in our internal legal order. I am troubled, and this is why I asked in an intervention, as to what the outcome was of the Joint Committee on Statutory Instruments today, and I made the reference to the question of whether or not there was proper consideration 
of the question of whether or not it was intravirus or ultravirus. I do not know the answer to that question, but it's because I haven't been given the information. And I asked the Minister to check whether that was the case. Did they consider the question of varies in relation to the issues before that committee today? Now, the intention of Parliament, Mr Speaker, is to be found solely in Acts of Parliament. It is not shown by resolutions of the House of Commons unless an Act of Parliament itself says otherwise, such as such resolutions in practice do not have effect. Under the principles of public international law, a state is entitled to invoke the fact that its apparent consent to be bound by an international agreement has been expressed in violation of a provision of its internal law if the violation is manifest, defined as it happens in the words, quotes, objectively evident, and concerns a rule of internal law of fundamental importance, and I refer here to Article 46 of the Vienna Convention. These criteria are clearly <coughs> satisfied, so that on the face of it there is a manifest violation of our internal constitutional law. It is completely and totally unlawful, and it is absolutely abominable that we should be faced with having to vote on the specious grounds of a so-called uniformity which the Minister has put forward. I don't blame him personally because, quite frankly, he's, I, forgive him, I, I, don't, I, I ask him to forgive me for suggesting that he's taking advice from other persons who are purporting to be learned in the law. But I'm afraid they are entirely wrong. That is the point. And Lord Panic himself only yesterday raised these very questions uh, himself. And Lord Panic, of course, is a most distinguished lawyer. Uh, in fact, he was the, uh, the, the, the lawyer for the plaintiff, Gina Miller, in, in the case which required the Act of Parliament, the Notification of Withdrawal Act. Lord Panic knows what he's doing. In fact, I go so far as to say I actually instructed him with others in relation to the Rees Mogg case back in 1993. Uh, so I know a little bit about the brilliance of Lord Panic. Lord Panic, Lord Panic says the legal concerns which some lawyers have expressed is that the power to specify the day and time when the treaties have ceased to apply is not satisfied by identifying two possibilities. It is not possible, if this SI is enacted, to identify exit day simply by reading it. He draws attention to this point, but I think it is worth considering the fact that Lord Panic is not to be taken for granted, and indeed for that matter, the Lord Panic has raised serious doubts about this matter, Mr Speaker. I'll certainly give way. But I think the House will be relieved to know that it is to be spared a dilation on the matter of Lord Panic's involvement in the Rees Mogg case, of which sparing I think I can comfortably be reassured by the Honourable Gentleman. Very good. Yes, completely, because I don't need to dilate on that question whatsoever. I am simply making the point as a point of reference. Now, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, with respect to the draft regulations, they contain unlaw unlawful sub delegation. The draft reg of course, I give way. I, I thank my honourable friend for giving way. Um, if what he says um, turns out, in fact, to be the case, um, what is the consequence if the government did make this decision um, and it turns out to be um, um, the decision was taken unlawfully or out with the scope of this place? Well, the, not bi the, the, the regulations are not binding and they're invalid in law. It's as simple as that. The draft regulation, and it's a serious matter, because this is, let us get back to the question from the point of view of the people listening to this uh, debate outside Parliament, this is, not an, this, is not, this is not just a question, Mr Speaker, about a question of process. It is about the fact that at, as we speak, as I speak at this moment in time, under the provisions of the Withdrawal Act, we are intending to repeal the European Community Act 1972 on exit day, which is the 29th of March. 
That is the law of the land, subject only to this rather esoteric question about the commencement order, which can be resolved in 30 seconds by a minister coming to the uh, table and saying, I now say that this is, commencement order is now in force. It's as simple as that. It doesn't require anything more than that. So we are talking about something which goes to the heart of the referendum uh, decision itself, the democratic decision of the British people, which was that they wanted to leave the European Union and that that was to be on the 20... And, and by the way, just one moment, if I may. House of Commons voted by 499 to around 120 for the notification of Withdrawal Act. The House of Commons voted for the Referendum Act and gave to the British people, contrary to the rubbish that I hear all over certain parts of the House, that somehow or other Remainers in Parliament have a right to be able to take back that decision from the people. It was given to them and they decided by 17.4 million that that was their decision. If this Parliament has no right to take that decision back from them. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful to my honourable friend, the Member for Stone, for giving way. And um, I, I never knew that we were going to have such a treat this evening. And um, <laughs> so it's a great pleasure, Mr. Speaker, to have the opportunity to ask my honourable friend a question. Um, it so happens that I've got a copy of the European Union Withdrawal Act uh, with me. And um, it does say in. Uh, Schedule 7, paragraph 14. Actually, Mr. Speaker, it was completely by chance because I had no idea that my honourable friend was going to dilate on this matter. But then I heard the member for Brent North saying, first of all, the word deviation as if this were some sort of BBC panel show. And second, I heard him from a sedentary position saying, I have no idea uh, what my honourable friend from the member for Stone is talking about. It turns out that Schedule 7, paragraph 14 says very clearly. A statutory instrument containing regulations under Section 24, which, for the benefit of the member for Brent North, is the section of this Act by which Exit Day is changed, so it's hardly a deviation, may not be made, may not be made, unless a draft of the instrument has been laid before and approved by a resolution of each House of Parliament. So it occurs to me, um, Mr. Speaker, uh, and I invite my uh, honourable friend to agree with me that he's doing an enormous <laughs> service to this House. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm extremely indebted to my very good and very close friend, uh, and I simply say this, that I'm so glad that he's made that point, because I am simply trying to do what I've always tried to do, which is to get past all the fog and ask the central question which bears on the issue of the sovereignty of this House in relation to that Referendum Act which gave the right to the British people and the 2008 Act to which he refers is the moment in time when we made that decision in this House and even the member for Rushcliffe voted for the third reading of that Act. So this was a decision that was taken by this Parliament. So forget the fact that these indicative votes which are going on at the moment, which I regard as, the, uh, as a parliamentary bag of licorice all sorts, <laughs> has been, is, is going through a process at the moment uh, of some kind of obfuscation of the fundamental issues because the draft regulations published yesterday uh, or a few days ago are not in accordance with the 2001 8 Act since they do not change exit day to a particular date. Instead, they purport to change exit day to two different dates, which is the point Lord Panic referred to, depending on whether the House does or does not pass a resolution which satisfies the European Council decision. The words, does not satisfy the European Council decision, Mr Speaker. I have raised this repeatedly. We have been supplicating the EU. We have given in to the EU. My European Scrutiny Committee last March made a very good report and we pointed out that we should not accept the terms of reference that have been dictated to, to, to us by the European Union. That's where it all went wrong. And it then went wrong when the Withdrawal Act was overtaken by the Chequers Agreement on a pre-planned operation inside number 10, driven by the Prime Minister and her advisers, the effect of which was to undermine the repeal of the 1972 Act. And I say pre-planned because actually we passed the Act on the 26th of, of June by royal assent and within 10 days 
The Chequers proposals have come forward, which morphed into the withdrawal agreement and Article 4, the effect of which is to make us subjugated to the rulemaking of the European Union. That is what went on, and it was done deliberately, and it was going on while we were actually passing the Withdrawal Act itself. It was a monstrous, I would describe it as a deceit on the British people. I would go further and say, the, in, in respect of the uh, course taken by the government of seeking to preempt the affirmative resolution, this has definitely contaminated the lawfulness of its actions and has, as a minimum, created serious doubts about the legal situation. And I would draw attention, for those who would be interested, in the views of the retired Lord Justice of Appeal, Sir Richard Aikins, who is entirely clear on this question. So I simply say, I wrote a letter to the Prime Minister yesterday. I have not yet had a reply. She has not, in fact, answered my question about the Ministerial Code, which I've asked for twice. And as far as I am concerned, Mr Speaker, this, this statutory instance should be voted down, and I invite the Attorney General to explain whether, as a matter of fact, irrespective of whether he's prepared to disclose his advice, which I think he should publish, whether or not, in fact, the Prime Minister did consult him as required under the Ministerial Code. Indeed. The Honourable Gentleman has concluded his oration. Thank you.